Okay, my guest today is Onur Yildirim, the director of uh, Field Trip EU or Field Trip Amsterdam. Um, and uh, I think it's a really good idea to explain first what this is, what you guys are doing in Amsterdam. So Field Trip Health is currently has uh, multiple clinics all over the world in mm -hmm. uh, US, in Canada, and now in Amsterdam. Um, when we expanded to Amsterdam, we wanted to do something extra on top of what we already did in the US. And of course, in the Netherlands, uh, truffles are legal, uh, psychedelic truffles. So we wanted to go for a program with psychedelic truffles um, and with ketamine. The thing is, you can't, you can't do ketamine and truffles in the same legal structure. Ketamine is a medical product. Truffles cannot be given in a medical context. So we had to choose, and since we're already doing ketamine in the States, we chose to go for the psychedelic truffles, the psilocybin, basically. So in the Netherlands, we are providing different programs that are centered around uh, uh, psychedelic truffle dosing, um, but they have components of psychotherapy before and after, which means that the truffles are mainly used as a catalyst to help you get deeper into your themes, deeper into the things that play into in your conscious and subconscious, and then afterwards also discuss these things and integrate them into your more conscious psyche, into your more conscious behavioral patterns with a psychologist. So basically this program is um, both psychotherapy and, uh, and, and a dosing with truffles to really synergistically help each other to come deeper into your issue, to understand yourself, faster and, and thereby also work towards new solutions faster. So it's kind of a, let's say, also a new idea of life support, like, or life um, enhancement, <laughs> maybe. But uh, what's interesting to me is, uh, since you guys are open now a couple of months, who are the people so far that are coming um, to check into the program. So is, is there like a couple of groups that you could talk about? If I had to uh, divide them into different specific categories, I would say that there are three main groups that come in. And the first group would be the healthcare professionals. So the people that are mm -hmm. following these, these developments in the, in the medical community with, with psychedelics. And they're just very curious. They just want to know what it is about. And now there's this new group, new team that does this. So, you know what, let's try it out. Let's see what this whole new hype in the medical community is about. So those are definitely a, a, a group. Another group are the people that work that 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 started their psych spiritual journey that want to work on their spirituality want to grow spiritually want to work on different issues or uh, to work through their life the things that they have accum accumulated in their life so basically people coming for spiritual personal growth um, this is also a very big group i would say these are the people ranging between 30 and 60 years old that mainly come for these kinds of experiences to really go deep, understand themselves better. Uh, second big group. <clears throat> and then a third big group would be the group of people that have walked into different uh, depressions, anxieties throughout, that have, have tried different treatments and now out of treatment, no treatments anymore, and that they want and they want to know if this might be something for them to to go deeper, to understand themselves better, and possibly also uh, have a sort of treatment. I mean, in the end, it is psychotherapy. Uh, a lot of our programs consist of psychotherapy, and maybe the truffles can help them go deeper and then really uh, get to the core of the issue with the therapist. Um, I do want to say that with this last group, these are only the more my, like let's say they have had different treatments and that sort of stuff and they want to try this still we have a very strict el eligibility process whereby mm -hmm. only the people come in that have mild or um, uh, psychological issues that we think are eligible to integrate uh, a, a psychedelic experience so yeah we do have a strict uh, in inclusion exclusion Process. So, of course, most people who approach us were interested in these experiences and they start reading up about it. There's a lot of media now, even in, in, in established media, 
the talk is about psilocybin. Everybody has heard it so far. So, but the question is still, what is happening to you <laughs> once you booked yourself into this or once you start to get in touch with you guys because there's a process yes. that you guys offer. So maybe you can introduce us to the process that Future is offering. Yes, uh, so currently psilocybin and psychedelic, uh, yeah, truffles um, aren't acknowledged as medication, aren't acknowledged as therapeutic, which means that there are no regulations surrounding them. However, at the same time, of course, uh, there is some wariness from the government that these things are happening. They're a little bit cautious, this new industry coming up. And, in, and of course, there's a lot of stigmatization. So uh, what we decided when setting up the program was to put safety first and foremost, to make sure that whatever happens, that, that no serious incidents happen uh, with us that can endanger the industry, the industry going forward as a whole in whatever way. So um, we have certain checkup points, let's just put it like that. When you apply for the program, you go to the website and you fill in the form and you say, yeah, I'm interested. You can book in a call immediately with the care coordinators. And this is a very casual talk where the care coordinators just go through the different uh, questions that you might have, the different uh, conditions and the different things that you might need to know before going into treatment. And these calls can happen multiple times. It doesn't have to be one call. If you're not ready after one call, they can say, you know what, we'll call back again after a week. So you can really get to know the program, get to ask all your questions that you have, etc. Once the care coordinators decide, okay, we've been through quite a lot and we feel that this person, if we uh, direct them to the psychiatric consultation, will be eligible because, of course, if you, during the care coordinator call, tell them that you've been psychotic just two months ago, then the care coordinators will be saying something like, you know what, maybe not a good idea to go through the psychiatric mm -hmm. screening call. Mm -hmm. You're going to be ineligible anyway. So anyway, so if this is all correct, uh, there's a good feeling, there's a good click, the care coordinators then can make an appointment with a psychiatrist, really going through all the psychiatric background. And we have a psychiatrist that is very intuitively strong, which means that this uh, person also is able to really feel where someone is in their development, which is very important. And after the psychiatric screening, you get a psychological intake, and then after this intake, you have the psychiatrist with the psychologist discussing about your um, about your case and to see if you're actually eligible to do something like that. Only after that, when everybody agrees, uh, the person is admitted into the program and then the program starts basically. So, and before we talk about the actual coming to the to the place and then eating the truffles, so why for you is this, let's say, this vetting system so important? Because as we know, we could easily go now on Google and find, punch in uh, a mushroom retreat, wherever, mm -hmm. and then you will, or like even even more ayahuasca offers, I guess, right now. So, and as we hear. Many times people come back from this, have problems integrating themselves in their lives again, or they have a really bad experience. So maybe you can explain, and I think that's what a lot of people are very interested in, why is this vetting so important? That's actually, thank you, that's actually a very good question. Uh, the reason why vetting is so important is because what psychedelics do in the brain isn't always um, experienced as easy, calm, or even uh, necessarily directly as uh, a catalyst to, to, to become better. So what I try to say by that is that psychedelics, such as psilocybin uh, containing uh, truffles, what they do is they actually um, force an integration of everything that is in the psyche 
which means that if the most easy expa- example to give here, let's say that you've just come out of an acute trauma, that you just had a very serious trauma, someone tried to kill you or whatever, and you're just coming out of this trauma, and you're just still having nightmares and flashbacks, and you can't sleep, and you're like uh, hypervigilant all the time. Let's say that such a person comes into a uh, psychedelic psilocybin um, mediated therapy. What can happen is that this, this, this compound forces an integration in the psyche, which means that all of the things that you wish to just, for the time being, put in a different place because they're too much to handle, too much to integrate, you can't do that anymore. The psilocybin makes it that everything comes up, all of your issues, all of your pains, all of your... And this can be pretty heavy for someone just just being traumatized to really relive the whole trauma as if it's happening again without control. Normally what we do, we do it step by step, right? It's the same as when someone is afraid of a spider. You just don't throw a spider on that person and say, deal with it, you'll get over it. You don't do that. Right, yeah. First, you let that person imagine a spider. Then you let, then they see a spider on a, in a children's book. Then a real photo, and then you know, like it goes step by step. And that's a little bit the thing with psychedelics. The fatting process is so important. First of all, because you do, you don't want to re-traumatize people that come out of trauma. Secondly, because it can bring about such a shift in perspective. Let's say you've been depressed. Um, but you have um, sensitivity to, towards manic or bipolar uh, tendencies. What can happen is once you see certain illusions for what they are in your depression, that keeping your depression, you can just completely uh, shift into the other side and become manic. Say, yeah, I understand it all now. Now it's all done. And then you, like, whoop, and then you make all these decisions that are also not helpful. So a bipolar sensitivity is very important to uh, exclude for. And psychosis, yeah, that speaks for itself. So I would say some people, when they go into uh, confusing or s- some dark thoughts, they can easily get caught up in paranoia or whatever. And these are people that are vulnerable for s- psychosis. And then maybe the very last group is in general people that are that have been sheltered their entire life that mm-hmm. have very difficulty to to acknowledge and to get in touch with their dark sides what happens when you put because psychedelics can be really dark because they don't only put bring out all of the positive things that are in you they bring out everything so exactly. if there's a lot of yeah, there's there's a lot of hate or envy or whatever it is. This will also come up and really be experienced as strong, but it gives you, of course, the opportunity to work through them. But at the same time, if you don't have a strong personality structure, this can be pretty heavy. So yes, the fatting process makes sure that we exclude the people that might have a very intense, too intense and overwhelming experience of that can't integrate it well. Right, but I, I feel we should say that, um, and I had that experience too, because I went through the program at, at, at in Amsterdam, I feel that the most interesting thing is that the pain you will experience or the painful topics that come up, you have a very different experience in the trip because you can look almost at yourself in the painful situation, yes. but, but you don't feel that pain you would feel otherwise. So you just look at yourself and, oh, this is interesting. This is, so this is happening to that person. So, and that's a very interesting, um, almost like, of course, otherwise unknown way of dealing with certain topics. Um, So, and I think that's kind of almost very hard to explain that this is happening to you in a psychedelic experience. Because if you tell people, well, I saw myself cut open on an operation table and they're like, oh my God, so what a horror. And it's like, no, actually, you just look at a person looking, uh, lying on that table. So, and that's kind of this almost like um, miracle, almost this kind of very unusual way of approaching things that seem to be unbearable if you listen to them without any psychedelic interference but okay so let's say you're vetted you're good to go you made the appointment you're sitting in front of the therapist then the day you arrive so and what happens then so maybe you can walk us through the process once you made the decision and you accepted to the program 
Uh, yeah. So when you accept the pro, when you are accepted into the program, basically um, you get to plan your sessions. And it depends, of course, on which program you selected, on how many sessions you have. But let's go for the basic program, which mm -hmm. contains one psilocybin or one truffle session. Um, so first of all, you have two different people that will guide you intimately and then different other people that will guide you indirectly. But the two most important are the therapist and the facilitator. Uh, the facilitator is basically your buddy and the therapist is your psychologist. Like literally just put it like that, mm -hmm. which means that uh, you have preparatory sessions with the uh, therapist about your teams, your background, the emotions that play inside of you. Basically, the, 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 the role of the therapist is to bring up as much uh, as possible from the subconscious into the conscious. Uh, so that you become aware of the themes that are playing inside you, become aware of the emotions that might have been suppressed, become aware of the conflicts you have with people, that these are all your working memories so that when you go into the dosing session, that you can actually work through them, that you can use these memories and work through them. Uh, that's what the therapist do, does during the preparatory sessions. Then you have the facilitator also, uh, that also does some preparatory sessions, do, does two of them to be precise. And one of them, they just uh, get to know the client, just like a buddy, literally like, mm -hmm. okay, hey, I'm your facilitator, I'm going to help you get through this. And some tips and advices. And in the second, uh, um, in the second session, the facilitator gives some practical information. So very practical, how does dosing day look like? How do you come in? What can you expect, et cetera, et cetera. And then after all these preparatory sessions with therapists and facilitator, you go into the dosing. That's a, that's an entire day. And this happens with the facilitator at your site and with a nurse outside of the door. So you're always um, look, being looked over by two people, basically. During the end of the dosing session, you also have some time alone to let it sink in. And towards the very end of the day you talk with your uh, facilitator about how it went what what are the things that you ran out into etc and then after this you also have an integration period whereby you go back to the therapist and have some integration sessions to talk about what happened how to integrate them into your everyday life so then the integration ends and you get an integration program that that continues the journey after you left us uh, on how to deal with certain emotions if they come up, how to deal with certain insights if they come up, etc. And after a month, three months, and six months, you also have contact again with us to go through again, like, okay, what have you discovered? Um, are, the, are these things still with you? Have they changed your life? Have you fallen back on certain, certain topics? How can we be of help, etc. So we try to also have some uh, care afterwards. Okay, so but it's interesting you already mentioned these six months. So um, because I think it's just it's understood that the, in the six months after the trip, things will come forward. You will experience moments in your life that you kind of where you feel, oh, I always behaved like this in that moment, mm -hmm. but suddenly without even you interfering, it's almost like your system says. No, 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 I'm not going to do this anymore <laughs> without you being part of this. It's like your system takes over and says like, no, I'm not going to engage in this anymore, which I find really, first of all, I really had that experience many times. And it's really fascinating how you almost can just lie back and relax and your, your new psychedelic system <laughs> takes over. So Actually, can, you, can you talk about that? Yes, yes, I can. It actually does work like that. And and for people to understand the more complex part of it, well, like how your personality changes, your how your automatic response style yes. changes, yeah. to understand a much simpler example, actually. Because it's, it, it can be uh, told in a much simpler way, which is, um, for example, when I had a, psychi a psych psychedelic retreat, I've done a retreat, and when I was at the retreat, um, in the toilets, the 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 fouts, the fouch, fouchet, or how you call that, is the sink. When you put it yeah. on, mm -hmm. yeah. When you put it on, you don't have to put it off again. You just put it on, wait, and then it stops by itself, right? Yeah. So you have these. 
And I was in such a plastic state, apparently, when I was there. <laughs> and I, I went to the bathroom quite often that when I came back, Something had happened in my brain that I didn't wasn't aware of. I went to the toilet. I turned on the fire, and I went, and I just walked away. I just left it on. I, the whole concept of wait a second, you also have to turn it off again, had been overwritten by this repeated action that I have done while under the influence of psychedelics that I don't have to turn off a faucet anymore. So I came on and I forget it all the time. I forgot it like four or five times. Like, what's <laughs> happening? And like, why would I even forget that I have to turn this off, right? And that's a very beautiful example of how when you're under the influence of psychedelics, if you think certain things repeatedly, if you, for example, you have an insight and it's like, okay, this is something I think about, but it's not correct. And then you go through that non-correctness and you change it in, inside of yourself. You repeatedly think it and think it, suddenly it becomes something automatic. Without you even knowing, yeah. you go, someone says something and automatically you respond like that. Like I automatically turned on the faucet and didn't turn it off again. Like it becomes an automatic thing and you... And if it's something yeah, that you should do, like turning off the phone, I really literally had to remind myself, no, this was only there. Normally we turn off the faucet, right? So it was very interesting how fastly that became an automatic understanding of how to operate a faucet. You know, that's like, mm -hmm. but the same thing happens in the deeper layers of your brains regarding belief systems, regarding yes. the way that you yeah. look at things. So, yeah. It's almost like, conflicts that you were kind of used to have with, let's say with a certain person suddenly your your brain seems to not find this conflict anymore or kind of skips the, the step where oh now the conflict is coming in for example so and and that's super fascinating to me really i have to say yeah, because normally so. i would say that we don't even like it starts off with a conflict by itself by the original conflict like yeah. someone it hurts you but then what we basically do is it becomes a routine it becomes a routine way of thinking every time a certain trigger happens that reminds us of this person or of this conflict we go back into Oh God damn! Just this, and I don't like it. Whoop, done. Okay, this this becomes like a routine, like a yes. Yeah. Not even it's not even in the here now. Maybe it happened five years ago. Maybe it happened ten. But each time, like we like each time you think about a good friend, it's like yeah, that was also a good friend, and this is and then whatever we go back into the conflict again, right? And uh, what happens? I would say with like what I just explained also is that. You get to see these things in a different way. And once you see it, once you shine the light of consciousness on illusions, they disappear forever. That's simple. That's how it works. You just never shine the light of your consciousness on it. You always have ignored it as something that hurts you. So you just like, yeah, 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 he's an asshole. Ugh. Instead of like, look at it shine your, your consciousness on it and see that you are actually hurt and that you have to deal with your hurt. Exactly. And, yeah, dealing with that also stops you. Or that, you, that your pain comes from somewhere else, but not even from that situation. That's, that's very interesting too. But I mean, like, what is the... I mean, some people now have already gone to the program. You guys are open for a couple of months. What is the main feedback you're getting from people who have experience in a trip. Yeah, the main feedback we are getting is, is very positive. I'm really happy with that. Um, and the positivity mainly is in the sense that people are surprised that this is possible. Well, let's start with the really surprised people that are people who actually have used psychedelics themselves. So they're like, yeah, I've used this stuff. Like, why is it so different this time, right? Yeah. Uh, um, so that's a very interesting thing that people have used uh, psilocybin before, but then they come with it's like, no, this was different. And I think different, first of all, uh, you have complete and other focus from the people around you to help you go through this trip. Uh, people that really know what they do, that can really sense you when you are dissociating, when you are escaping into certain things to make it less heavy or whatever. So they can really help you stay on the path. 
Um, second of all, of course, it's very important to set a setting. You might have done it at home, but like the, the simple small things are so important, even like how the room smells. It sounds ridiculous yeah. that that... No, 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 it doesn't. Yeah. But like even the smallest details, like how the room smells, can either make you let go completely or or hold on a little bit. Like, oh shit, I'm still smelling it. Oh, never mind. Just forget it. What is this? Just forget it. What is this? Just forget it. And you go into <laughs> that, you, you stay with it. Well, if yeah. it just... Okay, let go. Woof, you let go. It's more easier. So even those small details and... With small details, also uh, mention the the music, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and also the truffles themselves. So you have different kind of truffles that have different al alkaloids. So psilocybin is definitely not the only uh, ingredient that works in truffles. They have uh, around 20, 30 that are really active. And so what we did is we tested many truffles ourselves, also experientially, just taking them ourselves. And we came to the conclusion that this one particular truffle that we use are the best, uh, has the best profile for the work that we want to do. So some truffles, I would say, make you very activated, as if you're drinking a lot of coffee, make like activate, like ooh, activate, and a lot of thoughts and and that sort of stuff. Like that okay. doesn't really always help when you want to go into yourself. Some truffles make you very active in your mind, but confused. You're like. Huh, hmm, huh, you know, like confused about everything. You, I just keep wondering. And then there are some truffles like the ones we use who mainly work through emotional processes. So you take mm -hmm. them and suddenly you feel all kinds of emotions coming up and welling up and like, oh, I'm actually really sad about this. This hurts me and it comes and you cry and, and, you, and when you cry, you go deeper into those emotions. Like well, where did they come from? Oh, it comes from something that happened and I, I, I blamed myself and now I feel guilty. But why did I blame myself? Am I guilty? No, I'm actually very pure. I'm very, very innocent. And you see these things and you, and you give yourself a hug and that sort of stuff. Like that's this kind of process that these truffles trigger. And so we really made sure to have the right truffles, the right setting, the right music, aromatherapy, people that, that can feel where you are in your progress, all of these things. Um, I think one client really summarized it perfectly. He said, came out said, I've done truffles so many times. And every time they're, they're fun, they help me, I sleep better, I feel, I feel better the next day. Mm -hmm. But this was different. This was healing. This was really healing. It really changed me and a deeper core, it healed me. And that's something I never experienced before. And I would say that's the importance of using the right truffles, the right set and setting, all of it. What, what is the truffle called that you guys are using? Can, can you tell? Yeah, uh, so the truffles we use are called the Mexicana. Ah, the Mexicana, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we do. <laughs> So you have to <laughs> no. I'm, I'm now. I'm becoming this truffle expert. Very soon. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So those That's are right. the we use. We use them for us. We have different. We tried different Mexicanos from different people that grow them. Uh, there was one that's just the best in the sense of like this is just the most emotional, the most pure uh, in that regard, and really helps people to go deep into their uh, unprocessed stuff. And mm -hmm. really helped. Like it helped me, for example, when I tried all these different truffles, right? I tried them all myself, quite some trips there. Um, but the funny things, of course, I was also dealing with my own issues. That was more than a year ago. And I was also dealing with some issues. And with most truffles, I was like not really going into the issues. I was more like, ooh, this is interesting. Wow, this is strange, strange. Ooh, I don't understand. Like I was a little bit like that. And only with the Max, every time I took the Mexican, I immediately go, went into the issues that were inside of me. And I was like, yes, mm -hmm. what we want. We don't want people to feel, philosophize and to be in their heads. Yeah, yeah and I understand. But um, yeah, and I, I feel like the, now that if I think about my own experience a couple of weeks ago at, at, at your facility, so I mean, I've, I felt like so many things came up again that especially was suppressed last year in lockdown. 
And I mean, the, the main thing is I feel that you, um, you can start to really feel things again, but you feel safe in feeling them. And there's no um, problem that would arise from, from these feelings because you're in such a protected space. Mm -hmm. But I mean, um, I mean, I think something that we working on or like a thought that we're discussing a lot is that maybe if you engage earlier in life, maybe already in your 20s and 30s in an experience, like an, in a high dose experience, what you guys are offering, that it could almost work like a prevention for maybe severe depression in the years or the 10, 20 years to come. And I feel that really this is something that, I mean, of course, there have, might be studies around this that are not there yet. But my experience so far is if I talk to people who have done this a while ago, they really say that, okay, my feeling is that if I wouldn't have done this, I might have been in a very severe depression, maybe in a couple of years. So is, is this something you guys think about? Or is this a topic in, in the whole um, programs that you're offering? Well, yes, it is definitely something that I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Personal, personally, even, I would say that 12 years ago when I did my first ayahuasca session, it changed me so much. It diverted my path so much that like probably I'm at a completely different point than I would have been if I hadn't diverted that path back then. So I do definitely notice that. <clears throat> Regarding prevention, well, we can't decide this for the people themselves, of course. We can't yeah, sure. say, everybody come here because you might get depressed. However, uh, if someone comes in that is still young but wants to grow on themselves, we do, we ha do have an open mind to this. We do understand that, like you said, and this has also been acknowledged by science, mm -hmm that having a psychedelic experience in life can actually be a protective factor towards mental health issues. And right. it's actually very, very simple. You just have to have that experience, even if it's one time in your life, that your current consciousness based in ego, based in identity, based in personality, that that's also just an illusion. You just have to see it. Just once, even if you're 20 or 18, it doesn't, if you can just see it for once, that that's also a construct, that it's not real, then you can decide on how to deal with it, how you will observe it. It changes your relationship to these constructs of, of feeling uh, important or unimportant, feeling worthy or unworthy, that sort of stuff. You have to have seen it for once, that it, that right. there is an illusion there. And this changes a lot. I mean, it's natural that it would give people more sense of peace, more self-love, more understanding towards themselves, and naturally also more understanding towards others. I mean, yeah, so I do believe it. It's just that how do you scan for people that might get depressed and say, hey. Well, yeah, you that's. You can't do that. But yes, if people decide to do it at that age, I always think that it might be a very good, uh, yeah, very good thing to do. However, just one last thing I want to say about this. Again, if you do it too early, when you're like say, when you're still in the process in your teens, 18, 19, you're still in the process of exploration, your identity, et cetera, what it can do is consolidate a certain identity that's not necessarily the identity that you want to go with for the rest of your life. For example, right. you're 18, 19, you see that the identity of being a hippie that you just adopted for a while, it's like, yes, this is it. And you go yeah. with it completely. <laughs> Instead of just exploring it a little bit first and maybe discovering this is not for me. So yeah. I would say wait a, wait a little bit, explore your identity, explore the world, become 22, 23, 24 before you really take on an adventure like this to really look at it and say, is it correct? Do I want mm. to change it? Well, I feel like most people that approach us are in, let, let's say, who are getting into this very early also because now everybody reads about microdosing, but they end up realizing, oh, maybe there's a macrodose that's better. So, I mean, they're mostly in their mid, late 30s. This is when the first interest really becomes 
stronger to look into things that they don't want to engage in anymore. But I mean, we should also talk about your background. That's actually a very interesting one because you have a interesting mixture of being a clinical psychologist, but you were also engaged in, in, in the pharma world, so in a more medical world, which makes you an interesting combination of a person um, that comes from a, let's say, more like a new approach on, on psychology and psychedelics, but also coming from a very conservative world. Yes. So, and maybe you um, can talk about your journey in, in, the, in the old pharma world to the new psychedelic world. So when I started off, um, I actually didn't even start off in psychology. I started off in industrial design because I was a, I was a scientist, a, a B scientist, meaning that I was interested in maths, physics, and chemistry. So, uh, but that wasn't my thing. Became depressed back then. I was 17 or 18. So I went to a psychologist and really discovered that I want to think about the human mind and how it works. And of course, when you just start to learn all of these things, you do your master, you're very ideologic. You're like, okay, this is a science. People have, very smart people have done this for many years. They probably have figured it out, right? Uh, and now I'm the one following their footsteps until I figure it out. And that, that just lasts for like five, six years. Uh, you finish your school, you go work as a therapist. And after a while, I would say 10 years, I worked five, for five years as a therapist. You discover that it's all ideologic. Everything you've ever learned is just a theory that the real human is very complex, that it doesn't always work like that, doesn't always work that linearly. Um, changing someone isn't that easy. All these things you learn along the way. And it sort of destroys your world through that how you had build up as a psychologist that you know every, you're like, okay, I understand all the different issues. I understand if this happens, why it happened. If I can just show someone that it will change. It doesn't work like that. So you become frustrated. Um, and that's when I went back to university to go deeper. I said, okay, maybe we need to understand more about the neurobiology of it. Like how does the brain work? Maybe the brain resists certain changes or whatever, mm -hmm. chemical imbal imbalances or whatever you go. So I went really deep. I got my PhD in neurobiology, understand, understood neuro neurobiology. Um, after years of working on, in the university as a teacher, I eventually moved to the pharmaceutical industry. I was actually headhunted by Janssen to work for their research and development department of neuroscience to, to uh, design new kinds of antidepressants to help set up these clinical trials. And while I was working there, of course, having understood the neurobiology better now, I saw that there was a very linear way of thinking. In other words, what they try to do is identify very specific neurobiological enzymes, uh, whether uh, uh, proteins, whether these are receptors or, or whatever, and then see how they can modulate those very specific receptors to then treat the, the, the depression in all of its glory. Uh, depression is a social psychological issue. You can't just reduce it to a brain uh, function. So of course, naturally, all these rational drug design efforts failed. Um, I had done ayahuasca by then, so I was already studying um, psychedelics. And at the onset, I had a double agenda. I tried to, of course, go with the flow. I was new. But at the same time, I tried to uh, plan in lectures for during lunch, during different times that everybody was available, to really, to really show them that psychedelics had a promise in the future, not mm -hmm. only by uh, um, perceptually, because I started off by explaining the perceptual part, but also biologically, literally, like, the biological profile really matches that of depression. And I walked into walls each and every time. People are like, yeah, yeah, very interesting, but we can't have people hallucinating. It's like, that's the yeah. whole point. But yeah, so after a while, what I'd said is, is you know what? Uh, very simply said, and I hope you understand this, is, <clears throat> is up until now, we have designed different kinds of pharmaceutical agents that go to the to a certain chemical imbalance and then suppress it. 
So let's say you have issues with emotions because you're afraid of the world. You have panic and depression. So now we give them uh, an antidepressant that helps this system function better so that you still have the emotions, you still have the anxiety, you still feel threatened, but because the system functions better, you're better able to control it, to regulate. You're like, oh, this world is such a scary place, but I don't care anymore, whatever, ah, oh, scary. It just doesn't register anymore, you're blunted. That's what current antidepressants do. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, the brain is an interface for the internal external world. So the brain, what it thinks about the world will always translate into its internal world. If the brain sees the external world as threatening, you can put as much SSRIs or antidepressant into it as, as you want. The brain eventually will say, listen, what are you doing? We should feel this. The world is dangerous. You should be scared. Why are you suppressing your fear? And so what it does is it regulates itself to be more sensitive to these compounds. So it's less is needed now to trigger the same fear. And that means that the antidepressant doesn't work anymore. <clears throat> when you look at psychedelics, it's the other way. Uh, what you actually do, uh, this is also something that I tried to explain at Janssen, didn't really work is... We don't only suppress the biology or help the body, we also help the person plasticize their perception to make them able to think differently, basically. To uh, dismantle all of their highways, all of the highways of thinking, all of the highways of automatic thinking in their brain, so that now they have to go through byways, sideways, and still come to the same conclusion, meaning have to have new perspectives on the issue. See themselves from a third person perspective is what happens. That's what you just told. You see yourself as if from a third person perspective instead of the automatic way of thinking about who you are. And this just enables you to literally look at yourself as you would look at someone else. And it's like, I can always help other people by telling them what they should do, but I can't help myself. Yeah, it's because you can't see yourself properly. You're in yourself basically. Psychedelics give you that opportunity to go out of yourself, see yourself as a separate person, and then it's like, oh wait, this is so clear. This person is making this mistake time and time again. You see it. Or this is this person thinks that that he is unlovable or unworthy. Why? Look at him. He's so beautiful. Exactly. Such a nice person, right? And that's what really changes your perspective, I would say, on yourself. So um, that's something I discovered. Try to explain at Janssen didn't register, walked into walls, and eventually said, you know what, I'm quitting. Mm -hmm. um, the rest can, we can go through a little bit faster. Then I worked at Novartis, same issue, quit there again. I said, after that, I said, I'm quitting the career. I basically threw my entire career, my PhD, all of it, I built up so much into the trash bin because I was like, corporate world is not gonna work. I tried to change the system from within, I just keep walking into walls and I don't have to end. I don't want to get myself literally killed by tiredness by the age of 55 trying to fight this system. So I'm going to do it a different way. Set up my own, uh, set up my own companies. But of course, it's difficult to set up your own company, make, make it work. Did that for many years. Got a lot of experience and then Field Trip came on my path. Um, and in field trip, combined all the things that I've done, I, my research background, understand my psychedelics passion, my psycho, my psychology and therapy passion, uh, all of these th things combined into the role that I have now, the entrepreneurial spirit that I had. So it was um, a perfect, uh, how do you say that, turn of events mm -hmm. for me in the end, in the end, right? So, I mean, but, but it's also, it, it seems that there's a whole new, especially in the Netherlands, what you guys are doing, there's a whole new kind of chapter that's opening up about how psilocybin, truffles, later on other psychedelics too, maybe are kind of reintroduced into um, a normal society, right? I mean... And I feel that, for example, this is something that Michael Pollan is always writing about a lot and how this could look like, that it's not only strictly related to severe depression or severe addiction, but that it's 
let's say it starts before these things happen to people. So what, what is your, uh, let's say, favorite idea how this could look like, the, the reintroduction to a, let's say, in 2025, 2026? How, how do you think this will look like by then? I hope that, if, that instead of all the people, and I'm talking about 90, 95% of people, in the weekends, going to drink alcohol after glass after glass after glass until they have numbed themselves to the point they have basically killed a part of their body and their brain just to get numb. I hope that that trend changes and that people discover also other ways of coming together and going into a consciousness altering state. That's what it is. This is why you drink alcohol is to become in a consciousness altered state. However, mm -hmm. the difference is that with alcohol, you uh, retreat into yourself. So basically, you retreat even deeper into your ego, into your thinking patterns, and they become um, like very strong. So if you're, let's say, afraid of something or angry of something, alcohol will not only make them more justified in a sense. You feel more justified about them. You feel more right about them. You feel more, you can throw it out. No, I'm angry. Now I feel that I can finally just throw it out. Well, other kinds of uh, stuff like, like, like mushrooms, for example, especially when you come together, you take a lower dose of mushrooms, can really help you look at yourself, have deep conversations, help each other evolve. So I hope that in the, in the future, if you really look at it in a mainstream way, that people discover that they can also have these nights or these evenings, just like a dinner evening, this evening where they can do these things together and have a certain conversation on a human level, have a conversation on a deeper level. And instead of just numbing themselves and screaming at, their, at each other, oh, 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 instead of that, let's go a little bit more subtle. Let's go a little bit more deep into the realm of true understanding instead of just numbness. And you might also have a couple of ideas for a company when you share truffles with other people. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> so which yeah, yeah. would help so many things. Oh, that's something I want to say. Yeah. Uh, well, alcohol actually uh, dampens down the brain, so it makes it more difficult for excitatory neurons to communicate with each other, which literally means it makes it more difficult for the brain to communicate, uh, making it, yeah, numb, literally numb. You're more numb. You, you can't think anymore. You don't, you can't really, after a while, you can't feel anymore. After a while, you can't move anymore, right? So it just numbs it down. Um, yeah. On the other hand, actually what uh, psychedelics do is literally this opposite it makes the brain more interconnected more intercommunicating so suddenly everything starts communicating in instead of being more numb you be more oh you're more open you're more associative you see more things from different perspectives etc um and that can help in so many ways exactly i really I agree. I, I read alcohol as a poison of the spirit but do you feel that this has become the request has become stronger since last year, since the first lockdown year of COVID, that people really can't deal with their problems, maybe mild problems before anymore, and that they become more severe now? I, th I actually think yes. Uh, the thing is that many people were dealing with the issues. I mean, everybody's dealing with something, right? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, everybody's dealing with either an issue at work, an issue in their relationship, with their friends, with their selves, whatever. And what COVID did is actually exacerbated all these issues and even toppled some of them over the boundary of become serious, debilitating mental issues. Not necessarily maybe a, a, a diagnosis, not necessarily a serious depression, mm -hmm. but they're just struggling with depressive kind, insomnia kind, anxiety kind issues that have been exacerbated by by the by the whole crisis and we do hear this from people like i've been able to deal with it for a long time but the last year with all the COVID, all the loneliness it just got gotten worse and i really need to do something about it so this definitely uh contributes to 
to the issues that we're seeing. Um, yes. So there's kind of a post-COVID need. I mean, we're still in the middle, though. I mean, like, like a like a COVID-related need for working on yourself on, in a different way than maybe you used to do before also, right? Definitely. I mean, yeah. even more than people that have gone through these issues and all that stuff and really need something to help them at this point, uh, there are also many people, because of the sitting at home all the time, because they were by themselves all the time, they really had the time to think through of their life, to think through the different things that they believe yeah. to go into certain metaphysical, religious, philosophical, whatever type of questions. And um, that, of course, brought up a lot of things. And yeah, so apart from the people that have becoming more mentally ill in a way because of COVID, you also have people that have become more aware and want to go deeper. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. So yeah. I think b before we go, the last question uh, would be from my side, since I also, full disclosure, have been on the program <laughs> in the Netherlands. So I feel in Europe, pretty much everywhere from Europe, you, you're in Amsterdam for an hour. So it's a very kind of convenient way to, to engage in that kind of, um, I mean, we, we would like to call it um, life's next level of life support. But if somebody is really interested in this, but is also very scared to do this, which I think a lot of people are, and every time you engage in a new experience, you're, you're scared again. It's not that you're like, oh, no, no, I'm super cool because I know what's happening because you don't. But what would you tell somebody who's like really up for this, but is kind of um, blocked by, by old fears not to engage in this? It's actually very simple. When, um, when you go to explore another country, let's say you have a trip coming up, there's normal to have some nervousness. I mean, you don't know what, sure. what's there. You don't know uh, where to get your groceries or whatever the things are that you are already thinking up up front. Yeah. But it's an illusion, simply mm -hmm. an illusion, because you've never been to that country. So the, the scaredness is just an, uh, a fear for the unknown, which is very normal. People have these fears for the unknown. Um, but where it gets problematic is when they interpret that fear as being a, a serious representation of what's going to happen. And that's not the case. You can be afraid up front, of course, but that doesn't mean that the experience will be scary and traumatic or whatever. It's the same as being afraid of going somewhere alone. And you know, but with these things, even in, when you're afraid, you know, it's going to be okay. Right? It's a little bit like this. Yes, it will be scary. You will have new things, new imp in impulses, new things you don't understand. You Sometimes you will have to ask for a road. Sometimes maybe you get lost. But it will all be okay in the end. And this is a little bit the same. Understand that the fear is just a fear for the unknown. It doesn't mean that the, the experience itself is... Is, is a traumatic experience. The experience itself, to be completely honest here, is, can be very difficult, can be dark, can be very confronting, and eventually always relieving. And my question would be then, if you do have these issues inside of you that you're too afraid to look at, that you think you will be overwhelmed by, then ask yourself, what would you rather do? live in a comfortable lie or just confront the things that are the truth and just live with them try to incorporate them. because many people continue to live in a lie continue to live in something they want to believe about the world they want to believe about themselves because otherwise if they would have seen the truth it might really uh, yeah confront them make them angry or sad things that they have to work through that's a really good answer. And I think like you could also say even that you that these things that you say where you lie to yourself, they're not going to go away anyway. So they just yeah. eventually turn into things that you really have a hard time with at one point. Or people will leave you because 
you will not you're not willing to look into things for example so i mean it's not that you can always it's almost like an animal you cannot really you can let's say have this animal for a while but then it becomes too strong and it will overwhelm you at one point i feel it's so sad and in a sense that people that when we think of a seed a small seed and we put it in the ground we can see it growing into a tree right we can right. see holy that small seed became a large tree well it's the same in your mind the biggest issues that you might experience started maybe with a small seed something someone said to you and in response you said you know what maybe i am dot 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 and that's where it all started and then from mm -hmm. that moment on you were extra vigilant if someone thinks something happened that confirmed you said you see I might be like that. And then it got worse. Like, you know what? If I am like that, then why would you even bother right. about this? And then it got even worse because you became more harsh to people. And people said, you're an asshole. You said, you know what? Yeah, if I'm an asshole, you know what? Just ask like, act like an asshole. And it got even worse and worse and worse. And eventually it started off with a seed and became a tree. So yes, it is important to identify the seeds that you have been planting. To make sure that you weed your mind. Weed your mind. Exactly. That's that's a that's a good ending, I feel. You should engage you should encourage people to read to really read their minds. So yeah. thank you for being on the show and on the podcast. Thank you too, Anne. I uh, really love being on and um, hopefully we can do this again. We will, for sure.